This is lesson 452, the reunification of China. We've got four dynasties, the Sui dynasty, the Tang dynasty, the Sung dynasty, and the Huan dynasty. Let's mention the Tang dynasty first. It lasted from 618 to 907. Keep in mind that when we left China back in Unit 2, the Han Dynasty had just collapsed. It collapsed around the year 2020. And then China saw 400 years of decline and disunity. And we compared the, the collapse of the Han Dynasty to the, to the collapse of the Roman Empire. Remember that? The Sui Dynasty actually was first. From 581 to 618, the Sui Dynasty was the dynasty that came just before the Tang. And the Sui Dynasty only lasted for two emperors, but the Sui Dynasty had a great economic accomplishment, and that was the Grand Canal. And we talked that about that a bit before. The Grand Canal is often credited to their successors, the Tang Dynasty. This canal connected two of China's most important rivers, and it connected the southern rice-producing regions to the northern goods-producing cities that needed to be fed. So the Grand Canal linked China's two most important economic engines, manufacturing in the north and agriculture in the south. It was about a thousand miles long. A million peasants worked on it for five years, and as many as half of them died. Finally, the Tang Dynasty emerged in 618, and the Tang Dynasty lasted almost 300 years, and China experienced a golden age under the Tang Dynasty, and China reemerged as one of the world's leading civilizations. So how did the Tang Dynasty unify China? Did it in two ways. Number one, the Tang improved the government. They established a strong central government, and this was something that Western Europe was unable to do at this time. And this helped bring peace and prosperity to the land. It also helped the Tang suppress severe and prolonged revolts. The Tang conducted regular population censuses, and they discovered that the empire had 50 million people living in it. And these censuses are useful. The data you get back allows you to use your resources in the most efficient and effective way. The scholar official system. The Tang instilled a competent bureaucracy. Government officials were hired based upon tough Confucian style examinations. Confucius had lived way back from 551 to 479 BC, but Confucius had taught on how to have a harmonious society. Remember that? And Confucius thought that one path to a harmonious society was to have only educated, qualified, quote, scholarly people working for the government. And the Tang Dynasty actually reduced the size of its government by following Confucius' teachings. But it became more effective, and it saved a lot of money. In addition to the government, the second thing that the Tang did was make economic reforms that empowered the common person, like you and me. The Tang passed laws and made policies that encouraged trade and handicrafts. And the Tang established better internal and external trade routes. This all had significant results for trade. The Silk Road got busier. The Indian Ocean trade network got busier. Chinese ships traded as far as the Persian Gulf. And common trade items were salt, foodstuffs, spirits, tea, medicine, gold, silver, and of course, textiles. Handicrafts included things like ceramics, paper making, porcelain, tea leaf processing, metalwork, jade, etc. And this economic prosperity also helped people pay their taxes. Feudal style farming. Remember what we learned about feudalism over in Europe. It was a system of mutual obligations, land for service. Peasants had to work part-time for their lord in exchange for getting to work the land they were given to grow food on. But the Tang Dynasty did feudalism quite differently from the way it was done in Europe. The Tang dissolved large estates that were held by nobles, what we call manors in the West. And instead, 
every male peasant got a fixed amount of land directly from the imperial government. Not through a lord, but through the imperial government. The Tang did, however, have a very rigid and more complex social structure, just so you know. Instead of having a king at the top and then lords and then knights and peasants at the bottom, it's a much simpler pyramid. You have the imperial government at the top, the peasants at the bottom, and they deal with each other directly. In order to accomplish a direct system like this, you needed a big government bureaucracy filled with talented people, which the European kings simply did not have in the Middle Ages. Feudal style imperial taxation. In return for the land, the peasants had to do a certain amount of labor for the imperial government. And people could pay taxes in the form of grain or silk. The Tang prosperity fostered very expressive art and literature into a golden age for both. Buddhism was a major influence on Tang art. Buddhism spread to Japan and Korea during this time, greatly impacting, especially, Japanese society. Sculpture, music, calligraphy, and dance also flourished during the Tang dynasty. Building projects, infrastructure. Tang Empress Wu Zetian was a huge proponent of reforms and building projects. The Tang built the capital city of Chang'an along with several other lesser capitals. Look at the size of this city. It's huge. This was one of the largest cities in the world, and merchants from all over the world came via the Silk Road. The Tang expanded politically. They took Korea, they took Manchuria, which is northeastern China, and they also took Central Asia. Tang innovations occurred in several important fields. For example, cartography, Tang territory, and Tang trade were both vast. And the interest in accurate maps would have been huge. The Tang produced the Hanai Hawi Tu map, and its dimensions were 33 feet by 30 feet. Block printing. Block printing was especially necessary for printing Confucian texts. And this made the written word available to vastly greater audiences. Medicine. They identified people with diabetes and they successfully treated thyroid issues. The Tang Dynasty began to fall under its own weight beginning around 750. The government overexpanded in size, costs, and building programs. And they imposed excessive taxes on the people. They lost a big battle to Muslim armies in 751 at the Battle of the Talas River. The Tang eventually fell to external attacks and internal rebellions. The Sung Dynasty, 960 to 1279. Imperial Chinese territory actually shrank in size in the 53 years between the end of the Tang Dynasty and the beginning of the Sung Dynasty. And when the Sung Dynasty took power, it was smaller than the previous Tang dynasty. However, the Sung continued to build upon the achievements of the Tang. Sung China saw great economic progress. The government minted standardized coins. However, the Sung also saw the first use of paper currency when metal for coins became harder to get. And this enabled people to pay their taxes in money rather than grain and keep in mind, money is much easier to transport and to count. The Sung Dynasty eliminated the peasants' obligation to do forced labor for the emperor. And this gave the peasants much more time to work on their own farms. And this in turn resulted in greatly increased food production. And this led to greater wealth for the people and higher tax revenues for the government. China's population reached one hundred million under the Sung, and China's population doubled in size between the beginning of the Tang Dynasty and the height of the Sung. China had at least ten cities with one million people each. China became the most advanced country in the world during the Sung Dynasty. In math, they invented the abacus for making calculations, and in technology, they developed gunpowder, the magnetic compass, and the crossbow. 
Gunpowder was used regularly in warfare by the time of the Sung. They had miniature rockets. They had fire arrows, which shot through a bamboo tube. The magnetic compass. The crossbow. Movable type printing. Diffusion. Europeans adopted many of these techniques from trade contact with Islamic caliphates. And here's a movable type, a good description of it. Traditionally, an entire page of characters was carved into a block of wood from which prints were made. Pai Sheng, Chinese alchemist, came up with the idea of creating individual characters that could be reused whenever needed. Later, a government official created rotating storage trays for the characters. As you've read, Tung rulers restored China's system of scholar officials. Thus, education and printed materials became important to a larger part of Chinese society. The trays allowed the typesetter to quickly find the characters, and the typesetter would then order the characters in a tray that would be used to produce the printed pages. Two wheels held about 60,000 characters. The artists perfected the making of glazed pottery, that is, porcelain, and they also perfected the use of black ink to preserve writing on silk scrolls. And this facilitated an era of great poetry and historical works. Confucianism was a central philosophy of both the Tang and Song dynasties. Confucian thought was that women were supposed to be subordinate to men, and as a result, the status of women declined during the Tang and Song dynasties. Women had some limited rights, the right to divorce, the right to leave an inheritance. Women in foot binding, you've heard of that. This was actually a type of body mutilation. Wealthy women's feet were bound during childhood, and this resulted in small feet, and it made walking difficult. Small feet were considered attractive, and it limited a woman's mobility, making it more difficult for them to have a life outside the household. Northern Invasions Threat from invasion from northern tribes caused the Song Dynasty to make an alliance with the Mongols for protection. Then, the Mongols overran the Song in 1279, and the Mongols established their own dynasty in China, the Huan Dynasty. The Mongols unified both northern and southern China under the Huan Dynasty.